What do you think, everyone? No, no. Wow. What a turnout. And what, I feel like I'm going to cry, but what an amazing show. Um, my name is Karin Clark, and I uh, run this gallery, and um, like probably all of you was over at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum a couple of years ago when they had a fabulous exhibit of Olga Volchkova's um, Garden Saints and we all fell in love with her. So I'm just tickled that she, the last couple of years, last more than a year, has been working on this new series and uh, thought to show it here in Eugene. And, um, anyway, we, hi, Jill Hartz is here. The, you know, and it was because of Jill from the museum, and uh, you know who you know put that show on that we all just loved so much. And, <laughs> anyway, um, I want a quick thank you to David Lenig, who's the videographer today, who is volunteering his time to help me to record this special time. Anyway, I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm so excited to introduce Olga Vojkova. Oh, thank you all for coming. I was not expecting such a, it's a huge crowd. And I know like so many faces around here. And if I didn't say you hello, I'm sorry. I will do it later. <laughs> um, this um, latest show that thank you to Karen also for letting me to show you my latest work. So all big portraits that are looking at you. It's my latest 10 paintings. They're all dedicated to native plants of Oregon. And they're all connected, um, all faces like different, from different uh, kind of people of Oregon. Doesn't matter where they're coming from, but they live here, they love their land, and they became blended into the culture, and they respect it, and trying to make it better. So all creatures you can see on my paintings, they are, all, all creatures are native. Let me just tell you, like for example, this painting. It's a rhododendron, which is going to bloom pretty soon in a kind of a outskirts of forests in Oregon. And I wanted to represent all kind of creatures that live alone with a rhododendron like wildcat and uh, trillium that is blooming right now. And new um, fern is coming, like f um, fiddle heads. Plus, um, for example, I included over here a little horse that is extinct in Oregon. But we used to have these little horses, sizes of a kind of a small dog. So I think they, they called Eohippus? Eohippus, yeah. So it's kind of also included. And it's also based on a portrait of my dear friend who lives um, in a huge property outside of Eugene. And she loves nature. And she, she is surrounded by all these creatures. And that's her portrait. Maybe she's here somewhere. Uh, she's, <laughs> she'll probably come later. <laughs> and so for example, this one is a bear grass. So bear grass is a native to more like a high elev elevations in Oregon. And native people of Oregon, they used to make these beautiful baskets out of a fiber. So I included in a fabric over here. And bears, they are making beds out of this grass. And um, mountain goats, they love to eat new shoots. And it also grows right after scorching fires, and it brings vegetation back to uh, scorched land. So it's a um, very important element. And it's, it's pretty much like supports this huge ecosystem where everything is dependable on each other. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm, no, I'm going to stay here. But also, at that wall, you can see four paintings they are dedicated to very poison group of plants and they're all nightshades and um, they used to be part of flying ointment recipe kind of old witchcraft recipe and um, 
probably it's an idea that you used to rub this kind of ointment into your skin and you feel like you're slowly like floating, um, not like literally flying on a broom, but like slowly floating in the air. And each plant has a very interesting stories and part of those stories you can read under each painting, you can see some sort of description and um, so you can read that um, about each painting. So um, um, maybe you have some, something, you, you want something to know and ask me some questions now. <laughs> Discuss the influence of style with uh, iconography. Uh -huh. uh, the saints. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's a good point. Yes, I've, I already forgot uh, that. So I started uh, very early when I was 20 years old. I started to paint uh, icon paintings back in Russia, and Russia at that time was um, pretty much Soviet Union collapsed, and old traditions were coming back after. Um, pretty much absolutely not religious community during Soviet Union. And uh, this particular technique was like long lost at that time. And um, it was very interesting as a part of this icon painting school. We pretty much were discovering and working in the same time, discovering all this old lost technique. So I was painting a lot of um, paintings for church, like really um, religious uh, old-fashioned icon paintings. And I knew how to do it very well. And also, I was always connected all my life to plants. Like since I was <clears throat> probably born, we had a big place outside of Russia in a farm, and I was um, growing vegetables, also like uh, all kinds of flowers and plants. And in Oregon, um, it's just such an incredible nature with all the beautiful flowers that we don't have in Russia. So I was completely like attracted to Oregon nature right away and um, discovered a lot of it by gardening um, for one very, very good landscape designer, Monica. She's here. <laughs> so I worked with Monica for a while <laughs> and she's very knowledgeable about plants. So I learned a lot from her. And it basically, like all my, my experience in the paintings and what I really enjoyed and what really rejuvenated me through all my years, it was like plants and this technique. So they kind of merged together. Also, it was, it's interesting to me, like all icons, they tell in stories like about particular saint or event in um, history of religion and um, I am also trying to discover all kinds of stories about each plant and incorporate them with the symbols and colors and just with the beauty sometimes of the plant. So all, all incorporated together. So it's, it's, it's very logical for sure. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, actually technique, like traditional icons, they made with the egg tempera. And what is um, very special about egg tempera that it's very transparent. So you can put one layer after one layer after one layer. So this way you kind of build in a volume. You see over there, you kind of, I, first I, I place one color and then I try to build in volume, but I do it with acrylic because I use also acrylic with a lot of water to make very, very thin, thin, thin paint and applying it so you pretty much don't see how they're merging together, these layers. So it's, it's like sculpting with uh, light, I would say. Like sculpting, like, you know, this part goes in the front or this part and those, you know, so you kind of start, like you're building a relief more than you're painting. And, but I don't use egg tempera because it just, it's already like so much work and I adapt, adapt, adapt the acrylic so well to my paintings that I don't see why I should make my work even harder. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of already too much. But I make my own gesso 
it's only because I cannot find any alternative here. I would buy something in a store if I would find something like that, but I can't. So I make my own gesso and apply it with like palette knife and um, uh, sand it very well. So my surface is very, very smooth. And then I kind of fantasize about painting and write down all what I found out about particular plant and kind of writing a story with images and make a sketch. And then I would scratch all my drawing with a very thin kind of a needle tool. And if you see at some angles, you'll see those kind of lines that are inscribed into gesso, which is it's actually very useful because this way I don't lose my drawing, so I can do whatever I want in a particular part, and I always see my drawing. It's always there. So I, I yeah. It actually makes my life easier, that's why. <laughs> do you work on more than one work at a time? No. It takes all attention because you, it's so many colors, and if I work on a few pieces, it's very hard to balance. So I, yeah. it look, I try to look at in the end that it's looked like I just painted and I'm so in control and I'm absolutely not. So for example, I changed this background maybe like five times till I found exactly that particular blue that would work with everything else. But in the end it should look effortless, I, in my mind at least, yeah. <laughs> Yes, please. I think one of the elements in these paintings that makes them feel so fresh and relevant is you always have a little sort of contemporary element, like I love the nose. Exactly. Right little right tiny right. thing, but it should be there, something from, uh, <coughs> yes, from our life. Yeah. They are saints, but they're real. They are all over, yes. <laughs> Everyone who respects nature and um, trying to leave this, um, you know, life without polluting and aware of what is happening right now. And I think we all could be saints at some point if we fix the situation we are into. Like, um, yeah. I, I love that. I'm sorry to take it. The accessibility of sainthood that you present is so wonderful. And what you just said, like, totally speaks oh, to that. It's thank really you. beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Ta da! Does anyone ever object to the borrowing of religious tradition for what some people might not think of as religious? You mean if anyone got uh, upset about it? Well, I never heard about it <laughs> so far, but I love all kind of theological discussions. So if anyone would have any questions, I would love to talk about it. So me is an atheist, so I actually don't have any beliefs, so it's impossible to insult me in a way. I mean, not exactly, but <laughs> it's kind of changing. But I, I, would, I totally respect, um, and um, I just noticed uh, knowing this um, a Russian Orthodox religion, like a lot of people praying to images, they don't even know what they mean. And um, it's kind of... I, pro I mean, I, I, I'm not religious, but I know a lot. I love to know about not just Orthodox, all religions, what it means, how it develops through centuries, what it does to people. So I love to ask that kind of questions. And this is what I know what, how to do. And I don't think people should be upset about it. Or if they, if they would be, that means there are much more important issues in life they should be more aware about. <laughs> um, could you talk about some of the religious icon work that you've done? Well, it was a long time ago. I, I was in a part of this um, group. We were making everything from scratch, like whole iconostasis, because it was like icon revival in Russia, because all churches were completely empty. It was no icons. So we had to make produce a lot and learn how to apply gold, how to do gilding, carving, and structure of iconostasis traditional. It's kind of, it's like a wall between you and a holy space in a church. So a kind of um, between you and something um, godly. So that's what icons, they kind of this border. Um, so it's a lot of different paintings 
So they all absolutely create this iconostasis that each painting in its own place. So it's very dogmatic. You cannot change anything. So that's why it was kind of, uh, it was enough for me because it was no creativity. So I, I need to apply it somewhere else. But I love the way they look. I love icons, like icon art. When I look inside, like colors and how they dance, they're so intriguing and magic. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you all for coming and for your interest, and it's so nice. Thank you all for coming. Olga's going to be around if there's any questions. Yes. Please come back when there's not so many people so you can have the gallery to yourself and enjoy these pieces. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. Oh, thank you so much.